And, um, and here we go. So the question, the motivating question here is, can you build it? So can you build what? Well, let's suppose I give you uh, some instructions, perhaps for some, whoops, sorry, well, out of control. For some furniture, you might be given some instructions and you might find this uh, incredibly frustrating, these instructions. But you know, presumably they're intended, this is intended to be built. So these instructions should be, you know, should be doable, but you know, someone might mess with you a little bit and give you something more like that. And uh, if you think about it a little bit, you realize that may be that may be tough to build. So the point is, just because I give you a set of instructions for building something doesn't mean you're going to be able to uh, build it in, and um, what I mean is build it in three space in front of you. So let me, uh, I'm not seriously talking about furniture. What I really wanna talk about is embedding complexes. And so let me just look at the main case I'm interested in, which is does a two complex embed in three space? So here I have these uh, a two complex, I have these two triangles here with some gluing instructions. And I wanna know, can you actually build this? So can you actually embed it in, in three space? And so obviously that is not too difficult, I think for most of you, um, you can see that it's not too difficult to start gluing this together first along the three hashes here. And then uh, what else? To, oh, and then the two hashes and then the one hash and I get a torus. So that's pretty obvious. But it's also possible I could give you a set of instructions, which is a variation on this. And uh, that variation is, um, sorry, um, is if I reverse, whoops, reverse one of these arrows. So I reverse, so I have this red arrow, which is a reverse. Then um, of course, that's gonna describe a Klein bottle and I can start to build it, but I can't quite finish because it'll intersect itself. It won't be embedded in space. Now, these examples are actually not terribly interesting because they're both surfaces. And if I give you um, a surface, um, then it's very easy to determine whether it's gonna embed in R3 uh, just by computing the uh, Euler characteristic and the number of boundary components and the number of components. And then you can figure out whether it's gonna embed or not. Basically, you don't want it to be closed and non-orientable, that would be bad. Um, okay. so. Uh, one other little point here is suppose I take this first example up here, which was the torus, and I add another uh, simplex here, which I add another triangle and I ask you to glue, uh, to, to glue that together. And the question is, does that embed in three space? So now you see that this blue triangle is attached along edges, which were in the original one. So there are no new edges. Um, and uh, so if you think about it a little bit, um, you realize that actually you can embed this in three space, but you can't embed it um, with the same embedding used up here because what this blue uh, triangle is gonna describe is, is a meridional disc, a compressing disc for um, the, the, this complex itself is gonna be a torus. And this is gonna be a, a compressing disc for one side of that torus or the other. And you can sort of see that nine, not, none of those None of the curves, the, the two times the single hashed one and once along the double hashed one, that, that curve is not no homotopic in this embedding. So that would be bad. So the, the point is you can do it, you just have to re-embed this. In fact, that is um, what that is, is the two skeleton of what's called the uh, one tetrahedron solid torus. Um, okay, so let me, uh, let me go on now. So, this question, um, well, uh, oh yeah, one more thing I wanna say here, right? Um, let me point out though, the torus, there's tons of embeddings of that torus, right? I could have far nastier embeddings. And um, so, you know, you can see it's pretty obvious that the embedding may not be unique. Um, okay, that's sort of an aside really, it's sort of relevant maybe later or to some other side issues. Okay, but you know, in fact, this isn't the easiest embedding question you could ask along these lines. We could also ask the embedding question about a one com complex into two space, basically asking is a graph planar, right? Is a graph planar? And so um, here we see K33, right? The com um, complete bipartite graph with three vertices and three vertices. 
And that does not is not a planar graph, right? So um, there's another variation of the problem, which is I have a one complex into two space. So there's a couple of variations there. And you know, you don't have to think about it very long to realize, well, you could ask this question sort of, you know, and just vary the dimension of the complex and the dimension of the ambient space and ask this, you know, in all kinds of, you know, just vary those parameters and what happens. Um, so that was basically the question, I think that was probably motivated by one of my co-authors on an earlier paper it was Matashek, um, which is basically this, what the, the a decision problem embed KD is the following, given a K-dimensional simplex, simplicial complex, sorry, not a simplex, a simplicial complex, does it admit a piecewise linear embedding into RD. So K is the dimension of the complex, D is the dimension of the ambient space. And then, you know, I, I've been working with sort of computer scientists and what they're really interested in is what is the computational complexity of that problem? So how hard is it to compute this? So let's go forward a little bit and talk about it. Well, let's say we vary K and D. So these are the Ks down here, down the left side. That's the dimension of the complex. And the D up here, these Ds are the dimension of the ambient space. Now, obviously some things don't embed, right? If, if, if you take even a simplex, you know, that's dimension five, that doesn't embed into four dimensional space, right? So that's gonna be a problem. So over here to the left, we find that there are things which never embed at all. So, um, so if the dimension's too high, you're just not gonna be able to do it. And you also know, whoops, what did I do there? So we seem to be a little out of control, that if the um, co-dimension is large enough, if uh, the thing you're trying to embed, um, if you double the dimension um, and th that basically, uh, and add one, then you will always be able to embed it. So everything over here always embeds. So from a computational perspective, these are not very interesting and it's this gray region where the problem is kind of interesting. So, and uh, within the gray area, I guess I should remark that there are both complexes that do embed and for each of those blocks, there are complexes which do embed and those that don't embed. So how complex is that to solve? So uh, by the way, I, I, I figured that some people may not be so um, uh, familiar with computational complexity and um, I am going to sort of give a little shorthand here, and um, but I'll take a second to talk a little bit more about it before we proceed with the, with the theorem. So the first thing I wanna say is that it's sort of a result from 1974 that the embedding deciding gra graph planarity can be done in linear time. So, um, so that's actually very, very easy to compute. Um, so that's obviously, that's a, for a one complex, also for two complexes, it follows um, embedding into R2, those are uh, decidable in linear time. Good. Well, what about embedding over here? Well, it, it turns out there's, a, uh, there's an obstruction to embedding called the deleted uh, product uh, uh, obstruction. And uh, the thing is for, the, for, the, for these squares, for these rectangle squares, I guess they should be sort of at the top of this, um, so the deleted product obstruction is an obstruction to something to a complex embedding, and it's a it's a um, it's a necessary condition um, to to um, to embed. But also for near the top here, it's also a sufficient condition. So a um, result. This is a, a sequence of papers says that for what this is called the metastable range, that this deleted product obstruction actually characterizes the um, the, um, the complexes that can be embedded and it's, it's an algebraic construction and the point is you can compute it effectively in polynomial time. So it is relatively easy. Whoops, I lost, keep losing it uh, here. So these can all be computed in polynomial time whether a complex embeds. Well, what about the rest of this region? Well, let me go through a couple of things. So it turns out that outside of that region, outside of the metastable region, that those, um, and here's where I'm gonna sort of just allow you, allow me to be uh, a little bit informal here for a second. I, these are all MP hard. And um, 
so you may not know exactly what MB hard is. I'm going to say something about that in a second. But let me just say for now, you should just think hard, that these are hard or probably hard problems to solve. So they're difficult. And by the way, um, I'm saying they're hard, but I haven't said that they're actually decidable. But so they may be actually so hard, they're not even decidable. In fact, some of them are known to be undecidable. So let me just show you that. So this is a result of some of my co-authors, Matashek, Panzer, and Wagner. Um, and they also were able to show that for this sort of high end here, um, that those cases are undecidable. And basically that, um, that that's a result of, um, uh, this would imply three, uh, D sphere recognition for D greater than or equal to five. So that, that's the reason that those are hard, uh, are undecidable. So we have polynomial here, then we have these ones that are definitely hard and we have some that are undecidable. Now these yellow ones in the middle, they're hard, but we don't really know, are they, dis, are they, they may be decidable or they may be undecidable. And here I have a little bit of sad news, which is the last time I gave this talk, I said that most of those in the yellow were also known to been proven to be undecidable, but it turns out there was a gap in that proof. So I'm, I'm not gonna spare the authors the, the mentioning their names here, but that there's, currently a gap. So as far as my understanding is right now, this was is the picture, although I'm going to say a little bit more about these cases here. So um, basically, this was the state in like 2011, which was when I sort of got involved in this problem. And the thing that you notice here, of course, is that the dimension um, of two complexes and three complexes into R3 that we said nothing about those. I said nothing about those at all. And so that's where I sort of became involved because you know I'm an R3 kind of guy. So, um, so I'm a three-dimensional kind of person. So we started thinking about this. And um, the first result, which I'm not really gonna talk about today, I can say more, but uh, I'm not planning on it today is that these two are both decidable. Uh, sorry, that they're decidable with the embedding of two complexes into three space and the embedding of three complexes into three space are both decidable problems. Um, and it's basically the same as deciding whether a three manifold embeds into S3 or R3. So basically we actually um, work with the manifold case is the case that we actually work with in the paper. And I will say that I should have written here, um, you know, there's a lot of details for me to, to give here, but the, the upshot is normal surface theory. So normal surface theory can be applied to this problem to, um, to decide whether um, if I give you a, um, a complex or a three manifold, two complex, three complex or three manifold, I can use normal surface theory to decide whether it embeds um, in three space. Um, it's not, it's not pretty, but anyway, as I said, I could say more, but that's not really what I wanna talk about. What I wanna talk about is um, this second result, which is that these problems are not just decidable, they're also MP hard, okay? So they're hard problems to solve, hard in the computational complexity. So again, I'm gonna say something more about that in a second, what that means. How am I doing on time? I guess I'm doing okay. Okay, so that's what I wanna do right now. I wanna talk about, the, um, about computational complexity and give you some loose idea of what this hard means. Although I don't know whether it's gonna do the trick or not, but I'll, I'll make a little uh, one pass at it. Okay, so that's the, that's the picture, um, at the current picture. And uh, let me go on to computational complexity. So if we have a decision problem, so we have a problem and we want to give a yes or no answer, um, we want to understand how difficult is that to compute. And um, so let's take for a model decision problem, um, what's called 3SAT. And um, let me just jump down here to this little, this is a Boolean formula here. And um, you'll see that this Boolean formula is what is called a, a 3CNF or 3SAT formula, that you have some clauses. And the clauses, each of them has three terms. There are some variables, whoops. Uh, sorry, I'm totally out of control. There's some variables like X here. There's also negation of variables, okay? And then within the clauses, you have ORs. So 
you have T or X or Y and whatever or is here. So you have some number of clauses, each with three variables or negations. They're connected with ors. And then you take each of the, all these clauses and you string them together with ands. OK? And the question is, is that formula satisfiable? Is there an assignment to the variables, in this case, T, X, Y, and Z, so that that formula is true? OK? So that's the problem three set. I'm going to give you the formula of this form, and I'm going to ask you, is it, um, is it satisfiable? And you can see that this one actually is satisfiable just by using the, um, by the way, if you have a short formula, it's going to be satisfiable unless you do something insane. Um, just by making T true and um, the other three is false, then you will, you can, it's easy to compute that that formula is satisfied. Okay, so what about that? Well, let's just, let me talk about the complexity cl classes. So how hard is that problem to solve in general? Well, the complexity class P for, should be considered easy or polynomial. Basically a decision problem is in P if it can be decided in polynomial time based on the size of the input. Okay. Uh, NP, NP is, doesn't mean, uh, means, basically easy to verify. So if the problem is decidable, if, it's, if, it's the, if the answer is yes, um, then there's a solution that I can hand to you and you can verify and check quickly in polynomial time, yes. So I can convince you, I can convince you quickly that, um, that it has a, um, that the, the answer is yes, fast, okay. Um, so are there many problems that are known to be in MP that are not known to be in P? Um, MP hard um, or hard means that the problem seems to be hard. Um, basically what it means is a decision problem is MP hard if it's at least as uh, hard as every problem in MP. So the idea being a problem is MP hard, if you can find a polynomial time solution for that, you can find a polynomial time solution for a whole host of other problems. So basically what you're gonna have is problems reducing to other problems. That's the basic idea. Um, a problem is MP complete, not so important for us right now if it's both MP and MP hard. Okay, so if you'd like, just think of MP hard as hard. So what about this three set? Well, the thing about three set is it's clearly an MP because if it's satisfiable, all I do is I just hand you the assignment of the variables. I just say, here's what X is, here's what Y is, here's what Z is. And you just go plug, 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 you compute along. It's gonna be linear time. You're gonna say, yeah, it's true, right? So if it's solvable, I can convince you of that fast. However, it's not so clear to come up with a solution, right? An assignment, because if you have N variables, well, there's two to the N possible assignments. And so checking those is not easy. Now that doesn't prove there isn't some great way of solving it but it certainly doesn't look like it. Um, and so that's basically where, where uh, three sat is. So three sat is, is, and I'm not proving it, I'm just telling you this, it's MP hard. So it's at least as hard as all these other sort of problems. Um, it's also clearly decidable, right? Because you could just run through all those solutions and, and check them. Okay, excellent. So. Uh, now I'm going to do some um, topological background, I think. Oh, no, I want, have one more slide here. So, so the, the, the question about P and NP, of course, is it's not known whether NP is the same as P. Now, it seems kind of outrageous to suggest that some of these problems are solvable in polynomial time. And I think most people believe that they would not be. Um, but that is the most famous unsolved problem in theoretical computer science, basically, is is P equal to MP? Sorry, I keep jumping here. So there's two possibilities. They're either different, meaning the polynomial problems are a proper subset of the, not, of the NP problems, or it's possible that they're actually equal and uh, P equals MP equals MP complete. I think most people think that this is the correct picture. But anyway, so, so that's why I say they're hard. They're not actually known to be hard. They're thought to be hard. So if you like the H or MP hard is people believe they're hard. Um, but, and it's, it's not my failing. It's a failing of, you know, lots of people. Okay. So, um, all right. So um, now we're going to do some topological background, but I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. So I'm just going to go through very quickly because I want to get to the example. So we need to do some Dane surgery and, um, 
basically we're going to do what you would do normally, which is I'm going to give you a surgery diagram for a manifold. And so we're going to give you a link and there are going to be some coefficients written on there. And these, this is going to be pretty standard. The only difference here is that I'm going to have allow you to label some boundary co component with an empty set. Okay, so it's either going to be a usual coefficient or an empty set. Let me just say that what the empty set, empty set means is means to drill out that component. So it's a boundary component of your manifold. And then I can optionally, if I like to, fill in and perform a Dane filling on, on one of those components. Okay, so again, I think I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, but just say well, you glue in a disc, you glue a ball, you, I think most of you probably know this standard stuff. And so when I give you a picture like this, what I'm describing is a manifold with two boundary components, right? There's a boundary component, there's a boundary component. This has been performed surgery, this has performed surgery. Of course, this is kind of a silly one here, this one over zero. But that's kind of the point is that this, if I give you a surgery description of a manifold, it's not at all unique, right? So we can do Kirby calculus to change the picture and I'm not gonna do much. So let me just say that the Kirby calculus that I want here um, is the following, that you can always delete or add a component with a one over zero. Um, if you have a surgery diagram, uh, so by the way, the link should be in S3, that if I give you a component with a one over zero, I can remove it if I want to, or I can add one with a one over zero because it basically says, just glue this in, in the obvious way. It's not really doing something very interesting. Okay. So that's one move I'm going to perform. Uh, another uh, thing, well, you all know that most of you, I'm sure that um, link diagrams, why not complements our, um, our, uh, our uh, knots are determined by their complements, links are not. So these two link complements are homeomorphic, right? Because if you cut along this pair of pants bounded by this unknot here and twisted your manifold and glued it back together, uh, that would be a homeomorphism. You could think of it as a change of coordinates on your manifold, but it produces a different link. So um, that's, I'm actually not going to use exactly that, but that idea you can use for mod, um, modifying surgery coefficients. So if I have a component that is labeled one over T, then I can uh, perform T, I guess it's negative T twists here. And um, that changes this coefficient to one over zero and the coefficient here to P over Q minus T. Of course, this is really simple because this second component here, the linking number is just one. Um, and it, normally it's a little bit more interesting. This is, this is more general formula, but we're gonna do something very basic. Okay, so anyway, you can just take these as givens into the operation. So here's what I want to do is I want to convince you that deciding whether three manifolds embed in R3, so, um, is going to be a hard problem to solve. That's what my objective is, is to do that. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to work with three sets. So um, in fact, all of these problems are hard, the two complex, the three complex, but we're going to focus on the three manifold. So I want to convince you that deciding whether a three manifold embeds in R3, that that's a hard problem to solve. So what do, how do we do this? Well, we do this by a reduction from three set. So if you remember those, um, that, that Boolean formula I gave you before with the clauses, um, we're gonna be given a formula. And then what we wanna do is take the formula and build the manifold. And then that manifold is gonna embed in R3 if and only if that formula is satisfiable. So I want to have logically equivalent, uh, a logical equivalence between these two things. And so just remember your formula is gonna be looking something like this and that this formula in particular was satisfiable. It's the same one I had before where you set the variable T to be true. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, I'm gonna give you a simple construction that's like almost good enough. And then I'm gonna tell you how to modify it. Hopefully if I have time, we'll see. Um, okay, so the simple construction is here's my formula. And what I'm gonna do, I need to describe a manifold for you. So I'm gonna start with S3 and then I'm gonna put, uh, I'm gonna build the link. So what we're gonna do is for each of the variables, well, um, so the variable T, for example, you'll embed um, this chain with three components and you'll label them T, 
and then this will be a, called a clasp, and then a not T, similarly X, clasp, not X, and so on. And then for each of these clauses, you're going to have, so there are uh, three, there are four variables here. And for the clauses, you're going to add Borromean rings that are labeled by the variables or the literals. So it could be a variable, it could be a negated variable that occur in those formulas. So you're going to start with that. And then what you're going to do, so there are two clauses, so there are two Borromean rings here. And what you're going to do is you're going to say, well, we need to connect these. So um, T occurs here and it occurs here, just band those together. So band the T to the T. You'll do it to all the T's if there were more. There's not a lot of reoccurrence here, but there's a little bit. And so just do that for all of them, okay? So there's a, um, there's a link and I still need to describe to you a manifold. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna label the manifold. Um, we're gonna label the variables and their negations with empty sets, meaning their boundary components in the manifold. And all the class are gonna get a three half surgery coefficient, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so, so these are all drilled out, these are surgeons. So there's a manifold that depends on that formula. Now, what I want to be true, um, this is our manifold. What I want to be true is if that the formula is satisfiable, then that manifold embeds in S3. So let me demonstrate that. Well, let's assume this is satisfiable. Well, it is by letting T to be true and all the other ones to be false, okay? So here's what we do. We say, well, for the things that are true, so for example, T is true. So um, what we're gonna do is all the literals that are true, we give them a surgery coefficient of one over zero and the false ones get surgery, uh, get filled in with one over once. So, so by the way, X, uh, sorry, I, I keep losing control, I'm bad at this. X is false, but that means that not X is true. So in each of these um, sort of variable gadgets, one of them is gonna get one over zero, one of them is gonna get one over one. So it depends on each. And so now you see that I have these one over zeros here, right? So that means you can erase them from your surgery diagram, right? So not only that, but you can erase them from the surgery diagrams, but because the, that was a satisfying assignment, that means you cleared out at least one thing from each of the Borromean rings because there had to be a true in each of those Borromean rings. So you've pulled something out, okay? So that means that the Borromean rings now all fall apart, which is the, of course, the point of the whole thing. So what do we do now? Well, we just look at what we have left. Um, and basically what it is, is it's just a disjoint union um, of, how am I doing on time? I'm, I'm running out of time, but a disjoint union of hop flinks where you have three halves and one one written on there. And then you just sort of start playing around with the, well, you just look at the, the uh, coefficients and you see that you can twist the one one to get one zero. That changes this guy to a half. Now these are one zeros. You can erase them. Now you're left with a bunch of one over twos. Um, and those actually are just basically changing coordinates on, on S3. So you can perform twists on these since there's nothing going in there. There's not, no other, uh, there are no other coefficients you need to modify. And it turns out that you got S3. So there I built a manifold, um, which, uh, so I gave, starting with a, a three set formula, I built the manifold. If the formula was satisfiable, then the uh, manifold embeds in S3. That was what I showed you. What we need to do is go back in the other direction. I need to, sh to show you that the, um, that manifold, if it embeds in S3, then the formula was satisfiable. So what I would hope is that if the manifold embeds in S3, that the coefficients on those things, some of them have to be one over zeros, which I can interpret as true. You see what I'm saying? So I want to have that kind of embedding. You know that you can embed so that the complements are solid Tory. That's just, that's just box embedding. Um, but what, by Dane filling, but what, what I don't know is that that's true. So it turns out we don't actually know that to be true. It's, it's possible that that manifold has accidental embeddings. And so what I need to do is make the construction more complicated. <laughs> and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna complicate the instruction. And if we do that, then it works. 
And the part that which I already told you about also still works. So, um, so um, we're going to complicate the instruction construction, um, but I'm going to wrap it up pretty quickly here. Um, let me just say that how do we complicate the instruction? Well, for each of the variables, so here's a variable t, what you're going to do is this clasp, you're going to make it more complicated. You're going to clasp in a more complicated way. And what you're going to do for each of these literals for t and not t is that you're going to cable them. You're going to two one cable them. So you cable those. And how would you possibly show that something does not embed in S3? Well, what you would do, one way of doing it, and which is the idea here, is you would find some incompressible surface that survived filling, if you see what I'm saying, is one way to do it. And the beauty of this is that there's a surface there, this red genus two surface, which is sort of a boundary of a sort of a neighborhood of all of that, which is an incompressible surface in the manifold. And so if you fill to get S3, that surface must compress completely. And um, you know, I'm going to gloss over this, but I'll just say that the idea here is if the manifold embeds in S3, then this surface must compress. And it's been you know, built carefully enough so that um, the surface will only compress if one of these has a 1 over 0 filling. Um, in particular, that um, you, you can interpret one of them as true if you see what I'm saying, if we just think of one of zero as being true. And so that's going to happen for each of the, I haven't shown these other guys, but you're going to do exactly the same thing to all of these. And so you're going to have that either one of these is true, one of these is true. You also need to get that the bromine rings are, are you know, fall apart. Um, and I haven't, I'm not going to have time to show you all of that, but let me just say a little bit more, which is that the basic idea is, this is another picture of that same gadget where this is the clasp and these are the literals. And this red surface here, the genus two surface, um, if it compresses completely, two things are going to have to be true. One is that you're going to have to do a one over zero filling on either one of those or the other. And also, you're going to have to have that each of the bromian rings has something that's true in it. So that will tell you the satisfiability. I, I'm not demonstrating that to you. I'm just claiming that to be true. Okay, and um, let me just say that this relies on, well, a couple of things. This is this red surface to the outs. If you sort of think about it as a handle body on the inside, that is the complement of what's called that the, uh, the uh, handcuff graph. And that's known to be incompressible to the outside. That's due to work of Ishii, Kishimoto, Moriuchi, and Suzuki. And then in order to study the Dane fillings that work, we're going to rely on a bunch of um, surgery results, basically sort of classical stuff, Gordon, Litherland, Charlemagne, Color, and CGLS. And you know, if you look at all that stuff, it turns out you can just you know, figure out exactly you know, when this thing is going to compress. And that's enough to tell you that there's, there had to be a 1 over 0. And so um, that's the basic idea. So I'm not going to give you any more detail than that. Um, but I will say, let me just, um, I know I'm over. But let me just say one more thing is that there's some open questions, which is that um, the ones that are hard here, we'd really like to know if they're decidable or not. Um, and for the dimension three case, for uh, the ambient dimension three, we'd like to know, are they, um, we know that they're decidable in MP hard. The real question is, are they in MP? So I, are they MP complete? And um, also, it's interesting to think about that question by sort of thinking about the boundary of the manifold. Um, are there multiple boundary components, one boundary component? You know, is the problem any different? Is the complexity any different with the restrictions on the boundary? So um, that's it. I'll stop there. I think I'm over. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for such a nice talk. Yeah. So anyone on, on the audience has questions for Eric? Hi, Eric. Um, Hi. I think the thing that sometimes confuses me, but I think I finally caught on. Um, MP hard is sort of a, a lower oh. limit on how hard, right? It's a lower in, bound. Yeah. In, in this embedding problem, you're finding these operations that um, what those operations give you a 
a complexity within the, the problem you're studying that um, mimics the complexity in this other problem you had with reset. That's right. So all these problems are linked together. So if okay. you can decide the embed embeddability, you could decide three sat, and that one is linked to you know all these other problems. And you could decide that one. And you could decide so there are, there are polynomial time reductions between all of these problems. And saying if I can do this one, then I can do all these other ones too. Okay. And but the, but to me it looks like if you can do three set, you can't do an embeddability. That seems more complicated. I mean, it seems like you're just sort of finding out constructions that you know, show you, that um, you know, we don't have the reduction in that direction, but um, yes, but yes. Okay. Yeah. But um, we, we don't, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. We, no, the, the problem is, uh, the, the problem with the embedding problem is we don't know if it was an MP. If we knew it was an MP, then there would be a reduction that way, but we don't know that. Yeah. I see, I see. It might be harder. It might be actually even harder. Okay. All yeah. right. I think I think that was my issue, right? So it might be harder. Maybe it is the same, but maybe it's really we're not really sure. We don't have an upper. We don't. We have decidable, but we don't have a better upper bound than that. The the one you would be looking for is MP, for instance. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And you didn't actually tell us about decidability. Why why it's decidable, or did you? I did not. And it's normal surface theory. It's the short answer. The long answer is. Uh, Okay. Like much, yeah, it's a lot longer. Um, uses work. A lot of people I should mention Tao Li because he uses one of his papers and uh, a bunch of Rubenstein and Charlemagne and Thompson and yeah. Jaco, obviously. Any final questions? Okay, so thank you very much, Eric, for such a nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it's